Okay, you're official. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am going to uh, call the Housing Desegregation Subcommittee to order. Uh, the Housing Desegregation Subcommittee has now commenced. It is May 25th at 1 p.m. This meeting is being held virtually due to COVID-19 to allow for social distancing and protect the public health. As we continue our efforts in meeting remotely, we ask all commissioners and guests to mute yourselves until called upon to speak to avoid feedback and background noise. For those who have dialed in using the call-in number, the to unmute to speak, dial star six on your phone. Also, prior to speaking, please announce who you are to identify yourself. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. We ask that you only use the chat function to request to speak or to announce that you are leaving the meeting so that we can track quorum. Also, to comply with state open meeting law, attendance and votes will be done by way of roll call using audio, not by using the chat function. Uh, and with that, I will do a roll call. Lori Mazurba. I'm present. Jay Young, I am here. And uh, Vicki Casino uh, is absent at the moment. Uh, we have quorum, uh, two out of three members. So uh, I think we are good to go. Uh, so I uh, put together a new agenda um, to uh, try and capture some of the stuff that I think we've been talking about and, and rearrange some of the things um, that we have been doing. So um, I have uh, n as number two, our uh, Office of Equity update. Uh, and I wanted to uh, make sure that we have that as an agenda item, uh, though obviously we won't have them uh, meeting with us every subcommittee meeting. I wanted to make sure that we uh, have a place for them to uh, come and talk to us uh, if and when uh, they've got some news and, and, and just to remember that uh, we wanna be in communication with them. So um, any thoughts or questions about that agenda item? Obviously they're not here today. No, do we have any idea when they might be? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think I think uh, 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 the director is out on maternity leave at the moment. Um, so I think it's really just kind of whenever we would want to invite them again to, you know, whether we've got some stuff that we want to share with them or, or go over with them or, um, you know, to see if they've got anything that they want to share. I don't think we really had a schedule is just more like, hey, let's let's keep the conversation going. Um, so with that, I will move on to uh, agenda item number three, uh, HCD update. Uh, Neto, I don't know if you've got anything. Uh, I don't, Jay, Lori, and um, Allison is on is on break, um, and she didn't leave anything for me. And um, I mean, there really isn't anything new that you haven't heard already about, and um, uh, so uh, there is nothing. Great. And also that's just a, a placeholder. Mm -hmm. if there is some stuff to uh, talk about. So that is perfectly fine as well. Um, number four, um, I wanted to have a place on our agenda where um, we are able to bring things to share with each other um, that are pertinent to um, housing desegregation and, and just the general work that we're uh, doing, whether that be studies or new data um, other information uh, that we have. So I don't know, I don't, well, go ahead, Laura, do you have anything? No. Yeah, I figured, I, was, I didn't expect you to, sorry. I, was like, I, I thought it looked like wrong. maybe, I thought it, yeah, I thought it maybe looked like I did have something and I was like, I, I must be making a funny face. I don't know. <laughs> you, you did actually have the face of like, actually, I'm going to say something right now. Oh. So. <laughs> um, I do actually, it's not necessarily things to share, but I was, when I was looking over the agenda and thinking about um, number five as well, um, I just was kind of looking back over the stuff that has actually been posted on the CEHD website. So, you know, some of it is from previous full commission meetings. Some of it's from, you know, stuff that we have shared in the past. And, um, I actually thought it was really good to look back over some of that stuff because we have actually talked about a lot. And I feel like one of the things that really popped out to me is we have talked about a lot and there is actually a pretty decent um, knowledge base. I think that we're developing if we kind of go back and look that can really guide us going forward, whether it's 
um, our subcommittee uh, or just the commission at large, because I know that we're you know, talking about where to go. And I just wanted to point out a few things um, that I think are really worth thinking about, reviewing, and, and just kind of keeping, a, keeping a, a, a warm, I guess, so to speak. Um, one is the um, Prosperity Initiative. Uh, the uh, commission received a presentation from Keith uh, Bentley and uh, Bonnie Mazzotta, I believe. I wasn't at that meeting. Um, but I really think it's important for us to keep that uh, front of mind because I do really think that it is, again, one of the one of the initiatives that is happening right now that is really centering equity in a way that uh, takes it from just kind of conceptual to, you know, thinking how can we have a more equitable community or, you know, where are we in terms of equity and really uh, thinking about uh, operationalizing and, and taking action uh, around equity, and I think it can it can really help us, uh, you know, as we go forward, particularly as a larger as the full commission to, um, you know, help center us in equity, really, and how to how to think about taking action. Um, and I specifically am looking at um, the PowerPoint that again is on the CEHD website. Um, related to uh, the three housing policies. And uh, I just thought that they were interesting in terms of, uh, you know, good places to start and, and a good place to uh, kind of ground us. Here's the Vicky's coming. Hey, Vicky. Hi there. I'm sorry. I'm late. I got held up on a call. No worries. Um, so uh, welcome, Vicki. Let the record show Vicki is with us. So we have all three uh, members of our subcommittee. And just uh, in, in terms of catching you up, Vicki, um, so um, we have a new agenda that um, I put together and shared before the meeting, obviously, and um, it is what we're using today. And in putting together the agenda, I wanted to put something together kind of like we've been doing where, you know, there are a lot of things that we need to talk about regularly and that are also broad enough to really uh, be able to talk about a lot of the things that we are wanting to talk about and that, that we have been talking about. Um, and also, um, I am trying to do a better job of sending out an email to y'all um, for agenda items. And if you got stuff, great. And if not, that's fine too. Um, if, if I don't hear from, back from you, I'm just obviously assuming that uh, you don't have anything for the agenda, which is totally fine. Um, but we've kind of uh, buzzed through the first couple of things. Uh, obviously, there's no update from the equity office, uh, and there were no uh, updates from Neto. And so um, we are at number four, which is uh, basically sharing and reviewing information. Um, and I was just going through, Vicki, a couple of the things um, that we have gone through either in our subcommittee before or the full commission has gone through um, just to kind of like recenter ourselves and just to point out some things I think that we've talked about and that um, are things we need to kind of keep in mind going forward, at least in, in my opinion. Um, and the first thing that I got to, which again is on the CEHD website, is the uh, Prosperity Initiative. Uh, presentation that Bonnie and Keith did a, a few months ago and was just talking about, um, you know, I think it's an important framework for us to keep in mind. And um, in that presentation that they did, uh, they pointed out three housing policies um, that I think really match up well with what we have talked about and kind of what where we're wanting to go. Um, the first one, and again, I'm just looking at the PowerPoint that's on the, on the CEHD website. Uh, the first one is affordable housing to reduce the geographic concentration of poverty and increase mobility. And so I think obviously that's got the affordable housing piece that we've been interested in, but has also got the additional piece of reducing uh, concentrated poverty and increasing mobility for people to, you know, move to areas that they feel like would best uh, serve their, their families and, and their personal needs. Um, and there's a little bit of it, you know, a little bit more detail there. Um, and then number, the, the second one, which is reduce housing instability with an emphasis on prevention of displacement of households in high poverty areas experiencing investment. So 
you know, that's again, the piece of housing instability that we've talked a lot about that I don't think we've really addressed a ton, at least action wise with the full commission. And then, you know, the second part, prevention of displacement, blah, blah, blah. That's basically, you know, talking about uh, gentrification and displacement. Again, something we have talked about um, in, in our subcommittee, but haven't really tackled fully um, in, in the full commission. But, you know, the fact that it's in this prosperity initiative, I think is, is interesting. And then finally, support home ownership. The third one, support home ownership to reduce housing insecurity for lower income households and community. Um, and obviously, you know, Betty uh, Viegas in particular brought the idea of, you know, needing to focus more on, on home ownership uh, and increasing home ownership in the community. So, you know, those three housing policies, um, you know, in the context of, of uh, creating a more prosperous community, I think really align with a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. So, you know, again, just going back and kind of highlighting this stuff. So uh, jump in at any time if anybody's got any comments or else I'm just going to keep rambling. Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Um, what else did I come across? Um, also, um, you know, I shared some resources. This was probably 18 months ago. It feels like at least a long time ago. Um, I shared some resources that I came across uh, regarding housing segregation and kind of the effects. Um, so there are a bunch of resources. And again, I just wanted to draw it to y'all's attention uh, to review. And if you know, you're know you wanting to dive a little deeper into uh, you know, the current uh, state of housing segregation, which is still very much with us, obviously. And then um, you know, some kind of things to do about it. Um, so that's, a, you know, again, I had to scroll way down the way down the website to find that. Um, what else? Those were the two main things. Then there's actually also all on, on the list of materials that we have uh, received. And I don't remember this presentation, honestly, but it's a, uh, it might've just been something that, that we shared. It was the, um, it's a pre PowerPoint presentation by uh, Vladimir Berg and it's gentrification indices uh, focusing on Austin, Texas. And I think again, you know, this is important kind of like the equity study, but, you know, it shows that, um, you know, if we have the intention, we really can highlight and, and have done so, I think, with like PIVO study and some other things, but maybe on a deeper level, um, neighborhoods that, you know, have experienced gentrification uh, all the way to areas that are maybe most vulnerable to gentrification, but haven't uh, experienced it. And then, you know, thinking about some policy uh, interventions uh, to deal with that. So anyway, I, it was just interesting going back and looking at the things that we have reviewed and kind of the knowledge base uh, that, that we have. And I was just thinking, you know, it would be good or thinking about, you know, how to kind of tie all of this together um, to move forward with, you know, the, the what we want to do with this subcommittee, which I think takes us into number five, but I don't want to go there yet. Um, see if there are any thoughts or comments or you guys just really liked my trip down memory lane. Cool. Um, so number five, um, you know, I feel like this is, I put this on here because I, I think we're kind of in this space as a subcommittee, but also um, uh, as a full commission, right? We're talking about uh, trying to get somebody to come and facilitate and help us, uh, you know, get a better idea of where we want to go. Um, and so I just highlighted a couple of things that I thought that we have been talking about, and I just wanted to, again, uh, put them on our map and our radar. Um, you know, and I, I think the thing that we're all struggling with, I know I am, is like, okay, uh, we just reviewed a little bit of information of which we've had a lot of, um, but we have this frustration about like what to do and, and, and how to take action. So some of the things that I think that we have been talking about, again, just to kind of put them on paper and to uh, center them a little bit, um, you know, regarding our, our vision and goals. Um, and these are just like, you know, ideas, not actually things that we've come up with, but, you know, what does is, what is a desegregated Tucson look like? What does an integrated Tucson look like? Are, are, are they the same thing? But, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of both racial and economic segregation. So, 
you know, what does it look like to have a different kind of community? And then, you know, how do we get there? Which obviously is the $64 million question that nobody's been able to solve for the past 70 years. So um, yeah, I see, I see some, I see some movement. Go ahead, Vicki. Um, you said, Justin talking about is what you said, does a desegregated community look the same as integrated? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think no. Well, maybe they mean the same thing, but and from a disability perspective, I often think, you know, desegregated is talking about race um, specifically. And I, I think of integration as all people. Mm -hmm. And what often happens when it comes to building um, accessible housing is it's segregated. Right. Um, and so, you know, that like there can be apartment buildings specifically for older and disabled people that are accessible, when in reality, you know, every building should have accessible apartments and homes, which I'm really glad the city of Tucson has the visitability ordinance, because in the long run, that's going to help so much for, um, you know, individuals with disabilities and then older individuals who are aging into a disability so that they can age in their own home. But I, I just want to clarify, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I just, when I hear desegregation, I immediately think of racial desegregation, which is so very important. I just don't want, I want to make sure we don't leave out disabled people who also often get segregated in the community. 100% uh, Vicki, and I really, really appreciate you saying that because, you know, I, I, I admit I definitely do unfortunately forget persons with disabilities oftentimes when I'm talking about this, but that's, that's wrong. I mean, this is about uh, persons with disabilities as well. And, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways, the things that segregate, uh, you know, uh, uh, folks of different races are the same uh, forces are at play that are segregating persons with disabilities. That may not be totally true, but um, I, I point is well taken. Well, and then if we want to think intersectionally, there are lots of disabled people who are people of, of color and vice versa. And so um, yeah. I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to, what does it, total integration look like? I, I don't know. <laughs> right. Well, I do know that it is different than what we have now, right? I mean, <laughs> whether or not we can totally have a, a clear vision of what it should look like. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, we know we're not there now. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so yeah, so that's a good point. And let's definitely keep that on the radar as well, the, the disability piece, because it's, it's critical. Um, access to opportunity and creating well-resourced neighborhoods. I mean, you know, I think that these are, this is obviously really related to segregation and integration, but I think that you know, one of the things that um, Keith and Bonnie have heard is why do why is the goal necessarily integration? The goal should be that all neighborhoods are resourced uh, appropriately, and I think that there's a lot a lot of truth to that as well. So I think you know, as far as it goes, in my opinion, it's we need to make sure that we're dismantling barriers for people to move about freely and live where they can afford uh, and want to live. And also for folks who can't move, don't want to move, um, you know, like the makeup of their neighborhood that, you know, their neighborhoods are resourced uh, appropriately and, and, you know, equally as well. So while they're clearly, I think, uh, in, uh, linked together, I don't necessarily think they're, they're exactly the same thing. Um, and then, you know, I think C obviously flows from that as well, right? Strengthening historically marginalized and under-resourced neighborhoods. And I think that that really goes into the next one, obviously, which is gentrification and displacement, right? It's like you start putting resources into neighborhoods and then the gentrification and displacement starts happening. So, you know, as we resource neighborhoods, uh, how are we helping people 
to remain stable and in that neighborhood if that's where they where they want to stay uh, without getting pushed out. So you know, obviously that goes into gentrification and displacement. Um, I don't have a revision for desegregated. And then, you know, maybe really E should kind of be at the top, right? And it's like what we were just saying is, what is our vision for a desegregated and or integrated Tucson? So, you know, I just wanted to kind of uh, put some of these down on paper, um, you know, and I think it would be useful. I don't know what y'all think to maybe spend some more time coming up with our vision for uh, HDS if we haven't already, maybe revisit it. So I guess my question is, what do you what do y'all think about uh, what I've listed on the agenda A through E. Um, and then what do y'all think about kind of what we need to do? Because I kind of want to mirror in a way um, what we're talking about with the full commission, which is like, what is it we're doing? What's our vision? Um, you know, and, and how do we um, take more action essentially to, to have an impact? So um, Lori and Vicki, I don't know if you guys have thoughts about about that, you know, do we need to work on our vision and goals? How, you know, how do we uh, uh, make our commission, our subcommittee more action oriented? And what do y'all want to do next? I mean, I guess the big question is like, wh what do we do from here? You know. I think sometimes when I think about your question, when you said, what is a desegregated Tucson look like? Um, obviously I understand what desegregation means and, and I understand what segregation means, but I, I think it might be helpful to have a clearer definition of some of, if not just bullet points of what, what we think those things would be. And then it feels like that might be able to guide us um, in the direction we want to go because that's a really big concept and obviously we're not gonna go from segregated to desegregated overnight and so maybe some smaller chunks that we could bite off um, might be helpful or, or, or at least it would be for me. Yeah that makes sense. Um, how do you think we could get there, Lori? I mean, like, you know, a clear definition of like what that could be, like what does a desegregated Tucson look like? You know, if we were to do that as as the subcommittee, how could we do that? Because I, I agree with you. I, I think it's it, it would be great to have, have somewhat of a vision, you know? And then I guess my question also is like, do we have enough in, information? And if not, what information do, are we lacking? I think that's the question we've been asking for a while, right? And I don't think we have enough information, or at yeah. least I don't, I don't think I do. Um, and I wonder if it's not a conversation of the larger commission and not just us. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe maybe led by us as a subcommittee, but um, it just feels like an integral integral goal for the entire commission and maybe we're the ones that push it forward in that group and we were saying recently that we didn't have a lot of agenda items and this, and this feels like it would be time well spent right well and this makes me think of the the shared language that i don't know if it's really shared um like <laughs> I just, because it was a presentation, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that PowerPoint, but you know, there are lots of definitions and that PowerPoint is so heavy with text. Like I, I'd really like to have a document of shared language with what are the, the accepted definitions that we're using? Right. And, and you know, I know that's not just our committee, but maybe it's something that we could tackle or at least some of those terms and then take it to the full commission. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. and That makes sense to me. And I, I also like where you're going with it, Lori, in terms of like what we're talking about is something that really needs to be 
taken on by the full commission and it, it feels like that's been a a sticking point for us right it's like it feels like we have come up with some things and tried to and have brought things forth to the full commission but then it just feels like it doesn't i mean it just kind of falls flat you know and it doesn't have any legs so maybe maybe you're right it's that we kind of you know do what we can with vision and goals we've got a little bit of, at least of a starting point maybe we can flesh that out a little bit more and then really what we're doing you know what's it's may and then you know june and july we're just kind of fleshing out what it is that we want to see the full commission doing based on like the desegregation stuff that we're doing is that and that we're really kind of injecting that, that that's our our goal for the next like three to six months is just kind of refining our voice and vision a little bit and then just really bringing that forward clearly to the full commission. Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay, well, um, with that being said, I mean, that's a pretty good bite-sized chunk, I think, maybe to, to work with. So, you know, based on what the vision and goals, just again, that I just jotted down to get the conversation started, um, what do we want to do with these? Do we want to talk about, um, you know, our... Do these make sense? What do they actually look like? Like, you know, again, our vision and, and do we need more information about some of these things? What, what do y'all think? Like, I mean, let's just start with the question. I mean, you know, we're talking about desegregation versus integration. What, you know, if we were to wave, wave a magic wand, what would Tucson look like if it was, you know, desegregated and or integrated? Hey, real, real quick, I want to say uh, uh, there's a comment in chat from Javier Herrera, oh, uh, who is that? here with the Office of Equity. It says, desegregation is what is achieved through court order. Integration refers to the process in which different groups, racial slash ethnic, experience equal treatment in a post-desegregated environment. Um, and um, interested if that's something everybody agrees with um and um you know as we look at I, I suppose what that what the implications of that are is that um you know there were court orders to desegregate we've talked about affirmatively furthering fair housing and things like that those are you know um regulatory and court orders so i mean is that the process we're in and that integration isn't something um, we can envision until desegregation uh, or or what the implications of it are. Mm -hmm. um, is Javier with it? Javier, do you want to jump in? We'd love to hear your... Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Very good. Um, so yeah, so absolutely. I think, you know, as, as you look at this work, I think that the conversation that has to move forward is... Um, you know, what are we considering within the context of what are we desegregating from? Um, you know, it's not to say that it doesn't exist, but, uh, you know, when you move away from desegregation, I did reference specifically court order, but it can also be voluntarily, um, right? And, and so it's something that is in place. And so I think that that was what has to be considered. So if this is something that is voluntarily in place that we're moving away from, um, what is exactly that it is that is in place that we need to identify? Uh, at that point, we, we can say, you know, certainly utilizing that terminology of desegregation, uh, beyond that, though, at this point, you know, what you're really looking at then is, is that integration piece, um, which is really where, you know, equity component comes in. It's, it's talking about uh, how individuals get that equal and fair treatment uh, into that environment, whatever that environment be. It could be housing, it could be much different things, transportation, a lot of, a lot of different topics you can, can consider. Um, and so I think that that's what you kind of have to have this conversation and kind of come to a consensus around is if there is segregation in place, what does that look like? Um, and, and, and at this point, is that voluntarily in place or is it, is it something that is, is systematically in place uh, that needs to be, be addressed? Uh, if it's systematically, then more than likely, that's something, like I said, you have to address through court order. Um, but then if it's not, it's really something that you're looking at, with, like I said, through an integration process. It's, it's, it's that post um, process of trying to find equal and fair treatment uh, for, for populations. Javier, what are your thoughts about those two that those two terms and where Tucson is just kind of based on on your reading 
you know, is, is Tucson in a place where, you know, integration can happen because desegregation has essentially been, you know, ordered or mandated? What, what are your thoughts about how Tucson, how this is reflected in Tucson? Yeah, absolutely. So you get into a really interesting uh, dynamic here with that conversation, because what you consider then is a, a historical context of Tucson and, and considerations of things such as redlining. Um, there's areas where there are certain neighborhoods, you know, historic neighborhoods within Tucson that still have within their, their charters um, that, that people of, of a certain ethnicity or color cannot, you know, be within those neighborhoods. And it's nothing that necessarily is, for instance, abided to at this point. It's, it's kind of, you know, fallen to, to history, but it's still there categorized within their, their charters. Um, and, and so that would be a process of going through each of those, those neighborhood charters and, 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 and you know, changing those as, as, as we find those challenges. Um, but there's nothing that, that precludes individuals at this point when it comes to, to that level of, of where they want to move. What does preclude individuals, of course, is, is socioeconomic status, um, you know, other factors that can, can challenge populations and having that equal and fair access uh, as others. And I think that the biggest piece of it that, that we have, you know, conversation around, and you referenced it a bit earlier in the meeting, um, is, is the gentrification notion, right? And the component of discussion around gentrification. Um, right now, uh, it's interesting, we were just having this discussion yesterday with the uh, Planning Center, who's looking at the North, North uh, Sur uh, uh, project uh, and their plan. And they were talking about this, this issue of, of investment of resources, the same thing, investment of resources in certain areas. And um, what are the variables that you need to be cognizant of uh, to identify, and is there a threshold essentially, um, where you start to identify a potentially a point of no return when it comes to gentrification in an area. Um, and again, that again becomes an issue of, of equal accessibility. You have people that may perhaps generationally have lived within certain areas, but once their property values start to go up and uh, they can't afford those taxes or whatever it be, then that they start to have to be moving out of that neighborhood. Um, and so what are those variables? And that's what we're currently discussing and, and taking a potential look at as to what type of data sets do exist um, that could prohibit individuals from having that, that, that equal access uh, when it comes to, to housing or where they have been historically for, for their family or generations. Um, and so that's why I think you have to look at it from that context. I think right now, a lot of our, like I said, our, our, our energies and focuses are, are certainly understanding the historical context of this. And like I said, redlining and, and neighborhood charters um, and, and how that kind of developed, how that affected the, the development and growth of the city of Tucson uh, over generations. But really right now looking at that equal and fair treatment and access when it comes to affordable housing, when it comes to the issues of gentrification and, and ensuring that uh, individuals are not pushed out of their neighborhoods once resources do go in. Um, that's where we're, you know, a lot of the conversation focuses. Is, and so it really is comes to that point of, of, of integration um, and accessibility. So, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I, I, one of my questions is that, you know, I don't, I don't know that anybody can answer this fully, but, you know, looking at it from that perspective, right, of, um, you know, desegregation is achieved through a court order. I mean, you know, I would consider, you know, the Fair Housing Act, um, right. you know, the, um, the desegregation order for Tucson Unified School District. I mean, there, you know, there are various, uh, you know, laws, et cetera, that, that have mandated desegregation, you know, segregation, it, intentional segregation is illegal, obviously. So, you know, if we are at the process at the point of integration, why is Tucson still so segregated? I mean, I, I would argue that there's still systemic barriers in place preventing people from, uh, or preventing us as, as Tucsonans from being more integrated. But, you know, I think getting to what those are is challenging. So I guess I'm just asking, you know, Javier, from your perspective, why do you think Tucson is still uh, as unintegrated or segregated as it is. Right, and it's, it's really understanding the historical context. I mean, you could put this as, and on a national level, for instance, you, you certainly have, uh, for instance, uh, Juneteenth, for instance, and certainly emancipation of all the slaves, but at that point, those populations were affected with Jim Crow laws, right? And other pieces were kept meant to keep them, keep that those populations from achieving uh, full success. And so that being said, when you look at, at, at the Tucson, and as I mentioned, how Tucson grew, um, it's understanding how those, pro those those neighborhoods and how they were developed. Um, you know, prime prime example would be, for instance, would be uh, 
if we look at Encanto, for instance, uh, right near the Alcon Mall, um, there were, were clear advertisements for this neighborhood when it was being developed that uh, ethnic minorities or, or people of color would not be allowed to, to live in that area. Um, when, when, when Tucson around the turn of the century was, was growing, uh, it was interesting because actually a large uh, number of, of you know, the Latino population, the, the Mexican American population that exists in the area, existed on the south side of town. It was known as the Spanish Quarter or the Mexican Quarter of that side of town. Um, and, and historically, that's how these areas grew. And um, you have to look at really the, the historical context of what policies were in place uh, and things that affected that growth and, and accessibility by certain populations uh, to understand as to why those dynamics still exist in our community uh, and why it's been difficult for certain populations certainly to achieve uh, an equitable level uh, of success or, or, or placement in society as, as other populations have. Um, and so though, just because desegregation has, has been you know, addressed and, and, and put into place when you see reference with housing, with education and things of that nature, it does not mean equitable access. It, it, there are still institutionalized challenges that, that need to be addressed. And um, really when it comes to like, for instance, our Office of Equity, it, it, it's looking at what policies do still exist or what barriers do exist um, that, that can affect those individuals from achieving that outcome, that, that equitable outcome. Um, and, and it's, and it's far reaching. I mean, you're looking at things not only just beyond race and ethnicity, there's a lot of other factors that have to be considered as well. Uh, but it's, like I said, it's, it's a challenge. It's not only just unique to Tucson, a lot of places have had this, um, you know, you go anywhere in South Midwest, uh, a lot of places have challenges with how those cities and those towns grew. Um, and, and, and historically how, how populations have settled in certain areas. Um, and, and for purposes of, of, like I said, through, through accessibility, what was available to them and made available to them because of policy that was in place. Uh, institutionalized segregation, if you will, but, but through policy, there was uh, some maybe not as pronounced as being segregation. So, you know, I, I always always think about uh, populations that are, you know, that, that old adage of the wrong side of the tracks. Um, you know, that terminology exists for a reason, right? It was, it was populations that were put in a certain area on the other side of the tracks, the railroad tracks. Um, and you just got to consider those, those components of it. Uh, right now, it's, it's interesting because we've been discussing quite a bit uh, with respect to tree equity issues and, and the challenges and with respect to uh, not only looking at the, hundred, the million trees campaign on the mayor's office, um, but just looking at, at mapping of, of trees, right, and where though that canopy coverage exists. And it does not exist a lot in these areas that historically have not been invested in uh, resource-wise. So um, that's where, you know, we need, it comes to a point of integration of, and when you talk about integration, it's, it's introducing resources at this point. Uh, to ensure that those marginalized populations can, can be brought up and, and have that equitable access uh, and fair treatment to the same thing that other populations have had for or other areas of the city have had for, for decades at this point. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think the, the, the work really is what's so challenging, in my opinion, is, you know, it's, it's illegal to uh, discriminate and it has been for a long time, but we've had very little success in actual integration, you know, since the Fair Housing Act and other uh, laws were passed and, you know, really digging into why that is and what the barriers are that either we know are there, but uh, are difficult to dismantle or barriers that uh, are still really challenging to see, but that are there. I, I just would argue that there are still very clear barriers uh, to integration just based on the fact that, you know, we created our housing patterns through force of law and legal segregation. And, you know, that's not how it would have happened naturally. And so those laws are illegal, yet we still have had, had very little movement. So, you know, I think that to me is the, the work of, you know, the Office of Equity in a large part, and hopefully, uh, you know, this subcommittee and our, our, our housing commission as well. So. <laughs> I guess those are, you know, really the the challenges that we're that we're wrestling with. Yeah, and another big piece of it that you know, just to, for for food for thought, this to consider is generational wealth. Um, you know, if if you consider populations that have not had the same equal access, uh, or in areas that are not in that where areas where properties are of, of greater value or the property values are not as high, they don't have the tendency or the ability to build that generational wealth. Um, as, as other populations can, right? Other, other ethnicities have it within, specifically, you can even look at, look at city of Tucson. Um, yeah. So their ability to, to move out or move up um, is, is, is certainly 
a, a challenge. It becomes a cycle, right, of, of what they're experiencing and why that's why they stay within the area that they have or where they live. Right. Yeah. Great point. Um, so, you know, that, that obviously we're talking about a quite a bit. Um, what are you, what are y'all's thoughts about kind of more visioning and where we want to go with the rest of these, uh, with these items? Before you, before you move on, I, I want to say, I was glad to hear that Nortis is being discussed about um, from from equity perspectives, I I would love to for the city to really, um, you know, the people in the city to really be able to get behind a, a transit initiative. And I absolutely understand, and I completely am on the side of people who have real serious concerns about whether that's going to benefit the people who currently live in the area that 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 that's being uh, talked about with, um, you know. We're coming up on 10 years of the streetcar and the business district and incentive, infill incentive district around that, where we've seen real steps uh, backwards in terms of um, equity and, and segregation that the PIVO report definitely laid out in, in some of those areas. So um, I'm glad to hear that those are concerns that are being discussed and feel free to move on to what's next. Thanks, Jim. No, no, I, I appreciate that, Joe. And, you know, I think that I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and I'm, I'm happy to hear that as well. But what I think our one of our real hurdles is that we've got to figure out as a community, and I just, I think it goes back to, you know, how are we met really measuring equity? How are we measuring gentrification and displacement is that while we are discussing it, and I think it was discussed some with the with the streetcar, it has been certainly since the streetcar opened. But what's the policy? What's the policy initiative? What are the policy actions that have been taken to deal with what we know is happening? Right. I mean, that seems to be the thing, and I, I just feel like there's a missing piece for us, meaning the city. And all of us, whether it's government or, or the people that live here, um, about actually taking action on what we know is happening. And I feel like, you know, Norte Sewer is such a great example of and why I'm glad that, that you all brought it up. It's like, well, obviously there are going to be equity issues with it. We know that there are. So right now, what are we doing about policy, right? I mean, it's all about, to me, at the very least, uh, trying to come up with some policies to address what we absolutely know will happen because it's happened over and over again. And I feel like that's the missing piece. And for me, speaking personally, what's frustrating about Tucson is that, you know, I think people understand that we are inequitable and I think people care about it, but I just don't really feel like that we are able to take the next step and actually do something about it, right? I mean, all that has been said about the streetcar and downtown and gentrification and displacement. I mean, it's just hard to identify anything that has been done. And if anything has been done, it, it has had very little impact. And I feel like that's, you know, that's the issue, right? It's, it's what's, the, what's the policy and what's the impact and how are we measuring whether it's working? Go ahead, Javier. Yeah, you bring up the key point, and this is exactly what we were discussing yesterday, is that what are those variables, those data points that we should be cognizant of um, as we look at these areas to make a determination as to whether or not gentrification is happening. We know in a, in a, in a, in a qualitative component that gentrification is happening because when we meet with neighborhood leadership and, and folks that live in these areas, they tell us that people are, are moving out or, or are getting pushed out of their homes. Um, and, and so how can we back that up with data? Right to show that, that the housing market is in flux, that people are, are moving in or the housing prices are going up, things of that nature. Um, what are those various variables that, that we need to be, be paying attention to? Uh, and then secondly is, what is that threshold where essentially you identify and say, we are approaching the point of no return when it comes to uh, this, this, this process of what is gentrification, right? And, and gentrification potentially happening within this neighborhood. Uh, and if we know we're approaching that point of no return, 
what resources can we do to equalize or stabilize that neighborhood um, in order to, to prevent that from happening? Uh, and that's that's the bigger question I think that needs to happen right now at this point. It, it's what are those data sets, those variables that need to be considered, and then number two, what is that threshold that needs to be considered? Uh, and and to be honest with you, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, we have our uh, Laura Sharp who works with our, our Tucson Equity Data Strategy, um, you know, is, is looking at various data sets and, and variables uh, along with our IT folks and analysts. But at this point, I'm, I have not yet sure of seeing any type of of, of a journal or some type of, of something to study that's been done uh, to identify what that threshold potentially could be or what, you know, be considered a threshold for gentrification. So Javier, before you, I think before you joined the meeting today, we were looking back at um, stuff that's been shared and presented to either the commission as a whole or uh, commission subcommittees. Um, and one of the things that we uh, looked back on is uh, there's a presentation uh, by uh, who did I say it was? I've got it up on my computer here. Uh, Vladimir Berg called Gentrification Indices, and it's all about this very thing uh, in Austin and how they are measuring gentrification, how they are, you know, showing neighborhoods that are, like you said, kind of past the point of no return versus, you know, neighborhoods that are vulnerable. Uh, and kind of everywhere in between. So, you know, there is some good stuff out there and some stuff, like I said, that we have actually kind of uh, uh, brought up in the commission. So if you look back uh, on the commission website, you can find that presentation. But, you know, there are places that are doing it. Um, you know, another, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, but, um, you know, King County, where Seattle is in particular, uh, does a, a pretty good job of, of measuring a lot of this stuff. Um, so yeah, I, you know, really the, I feel like, you know, I've, I've actually been reading a book recently about um, the development of the, uh, I, I, I'm blanking on what it's called, but the, like the green belt in Atlanta, the redevelopment of the kind of <gasps> this old railroad area that goes around the city and just all of the missed opportunities along the way to put policies in place to keep neighborhoods stable that everybody knew we're going to gentrify and you know like the the project's been you know in the works for a long time and is you know now starting to really come to fruition and you know like for instance back when the financial crisis happened and you know there people were basically giving properties away you know as opposed to the the city and other entities um you know buying up those properties either to maintain as for, you know, low to moderate income folks or, um, you know, just to keep from uh, out of out of speculators hands, you know, nobody ever really did anything. So I think Atlanta is a really good uh, example, a current example of us. I mean, obviously, the 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 development that Atlanta is doing is different from like Norte Sewer, but I think it's a just a really good example of if you're not out and like Joe, you've said for a long time now, if you're not way out in front, like now of North, something like Norte Sewer, I mean, could you even argue that it's actually already in terms of the speculation already starting? Maybe not, but you know, now's the time, I think. I got two things uh, before we move on. Uh, Jay, are you reading Dan Immerglock? Yeah. Red Hot City, all right. There you go. You probably uh, recommended it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I requested that from the public library. I just put a link to the book in the, in the chat if anybody wants to check it out. I haven't read it yet, but I followed um, some of Dan Emmerglut's research on on stuff, and he seems to really have a handle handle on that. So that's great. Number two, we mentioned the wrong side of the tracks. Interestingly enough, there was a master's thesis a couple of years ago. Uh, the author was Janie Elizabeth Adams. It was called Wrong Side of the Tracks, Transportation Systems and Exclusionary Urban Planning in Tucson. Um, if anybody's interested, you can look that up and it's the 106 pages, but um, not a horrible read for, for what it is. Uh, it's a master's thesis 2019. Um, and if you're interested in kind of some of the how we got here stuff with regards to that, it actually talks about um, how things were kind of planned around Southern Pacific and, and those kind of things and exclusionary planning, specifically in Tucson. Number three, um, the dis the discussion about um, measuring the gentrification um, kind of consistently catches a little bit of my ire because 
Um, this commission exists because we started talking about that. And a, a lot of, we did. It, it always starts with, I, you know, one of the things I like to say is that, yeah, we, we want to have the data. Every data point is somebody's experience. Those are all at some point anecdotes before we compile them and, and make it data. So we heard the anecdotes. We told the city, uh, hey, we think this is a problem. And, you know, Gary Pilo's report was one that he came up with in a few months, but said, here's how we're measuring uh, displacement. Here's how we're going to talk about gentrification. And we see the area of Barrio Viejo going from 60% Hispanic to 40% in the span of what, eight or nine years. Um, so uh, by the time we measure that it's happened, you're right. It's just it's okay, it happened, it's already too late. Okay, so how do we prevent that in the places where it hasn't happened? I feel like is the question. Um, and I mean, maybe we talk about this because we think there can be neighborhood-wide initiatives to prevent it, but it seems like it feels to me like it's gotta be bigger than that. If we know it's occurring, and, and Gary Pivo was the guy the city picked to do this. This wasn't somebody I picked. The city, the city's person said this was, this is something that's occurring um, in the vast majority of blocks in and around the central business district. We know it's happening in Tucson. You know, it's been happening. We know where we are in kind of the cycle of it, like um, the Victor Berg presentation talks about, you know, different cycles of it. I don't think we ever talked about that in, in a meeting, but, but, you know, it's there to read. Um, we know that that we're in this this cycle of it and 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 where different places are uh in that and if there's things we can do to interrupt that those should be policies that we're moving forward with as a city that we're advocating for at other levels of government the county and the state and all and um i'm concerned that we spend a couple more years on coming up with here's how we measure it here's how much it's happening. And then maybe we get around to stopping it and putting in policy that can help us with it. And, um, you know, the best time to plant the trees 30 years ago, the second best time is now. Um, that's, that's my thought. I don't mean, sorry, Javier, to, 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 to direct that uh, at you, but whenever I hear about the need for the data and the, the more we need to study it, it's like okay, well, um, why don't we study it while we're <laughs> while we're trying to fight it? Go ahead, Javier. No, and you, you bring up an exact point. This is exactly what we were discussing yesterday as well. Um, is, is that that live data, um, something that is is routinely and regularly updated so that we have an accurate pulse of what is taking place? Because you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, if, if we wait for two years, it's already too late, right? Uh, and so what we've been doing at this point is actually our IT analyst folks, as well as our, our contractor they work with uh, and developing all these data sets is actually writing script so that we can pull this information from, from sites. Uh, a prime example of that that was discussed yesterday was uh, housing.com. Uh, and so getting a live feed of, of housing within those, those areas to know exactly if properties are going up for sale, uh, identifying the flux and what the property values are as, as, those, as those changes take place. Uh, and these are the types of things, like I said, that are going to give us a, a, a good gauge, a live gauge uh, of what is happening in real time, as close to real time as we could potentially get. But the second point to you that you, you certainly referenced is, is the policy component. Uh, you know, it's going to be very much key that, that policy be developed and potentially introduced to mayor and council um, to get ahead of this. And so that, you know, there is something that we have a fallback for that we know that uh, if we start reaching a, a potential threshold, their resources automatically kick in or things happen. Uh, to change that direction or, or change, do a course direction change, um, and so yeah, I, I, I you know fall very much strongly in accord with the group and what everybody's discussing today. I think that you know you can't wait; you need to have that information as quickly and as live as you can, uh, and have those data sets updated regularly so that you can react to them in a timely fashion. Quick question: In the near future, um, as that discussion is happening with the office of equity. Uh, Jay's put on the agenda an item for updates from that office. Uh, is 
the Office of Equity's thoughts on how to keep people in housing and prevent displacement, something that um, this commission will or could be updated with? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. As those conversations evolve, we'd be happy to keep you up to date on those conversations. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for bringing that up, Joe. Yeah, I don't know, Javier, if you've got the agenda open, but obviously it's on the uh, CEHD website. But yeah, we put a, a holding place um, on our agenda for uh, Office of Equity updates. So, you know, anytime that you guys uh, have anything that you want to engage with us about or share or uh, whatever you are already on the agenda. So, uh, you know, you can just let us know a, a little bit beforehand. Um, and, you know, if we are uh, having some things that we want to share with y'all or discuss as well, we will certainly uh, extend an invitation. But just know that, um, you know, when we talked to Larice uh, a couple of meetings ago, uh, we did all agree to uh, continue the conversation, which partly I assume is why you're here. So yeah, it's great. that's exactly it. Yeah, and Larissa is, is is out on maternity at this point. So yeah. Yeah, beautiful baby girl back on on May third. Uh, so she'll be coming back here in, in a in a remote capacity starting in July, second week of July. But but yeah, I'll be sitting on these meetings for sure moving forward. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, we we do appreciate your attendance, and like I said, you guys are on the agenda. So uh, come with it, anything you'd like to share, or just. Uh, you know, be part of the meeting either way. I really appreciate that. Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to pick up on as well um, that I think is interesting that we that we need to focus in on too, particularly like as we, as the full commission kind of, you know, uh, plot our course is we do have enough data now, in my opinion, with the PIVO study, the neighborhood stress index. You know, there are already plenty. There are already some things that we know. Um, we also know just from uh, anecdotal evidence, which you know, Joe, you make a great point. Uh, you know, the data is made up of of individual people and, and instances. Um, and I think there's enough information now to start to develop policy to address what we know is happening now. And in parallel, not before, uh, we need to measure and refine the data and the measuring in parallel, because again, I'm like, we, we, we know what's happening. Uh, we, we could probably know a little bit better. We could probably measure better, but like, I, you know, we don't, I don't feel like we need a lot of more, lot more information now to start creating policies to stabilize neighborhoods um, and uh, prevent the displacement that we know is happening. So, you know, again, maybe that can be something that we're uh, from our subcommittee that you know, as we engage with the full commission about where we're going, that, you know, again, as we've been saying, uh, that's really one of our, our touchstones is the, the gentrification and displacement piece um, and, and, you know, demanding some policy action there. And then, um, you know, the parallel tract of, of measurement. So I'm trying to write, uh, you know, keep some decent notes. Um, I know we're just kind of like, again, having a, a, a good and robust conversation with Sometimes I'm like, where do we go? What, what comes out of these conversations or, you know, what, what the action piece is. So I'm hoping that uh, Lori, particularly you and Vicki can, um, you know, help hold me and hold us accountable for uh, figuring out based on these conversations, how we're, you know, taking action, engaging with the full commission. I feel like that that's often a struggle for me and, and what we keep going back to. So I just want to, want to flag that. Um, what else, y'all? I'm, I'm again looking at number five and just the the items. It, is there anything, on, in terms of vision and goals, for our subcommittee that we haven't really discussed today, uh, that's not on the list, the A through E, uh, that we is kind of our working list at this point. Is there anything that we're missing so far? Things that we've talked about in the past, or maybe things that have come up. Um, I mean, I guess I would actually say maybe really, um, you know, and I don't know if it's a separate goal or whatever, but just for the sake of keeping it front and center is maybe F should be, um, you know, uh, I'm not going to articulate it great right now, but, you know, just keeping in mind that this is also about persons with disabilities, like Vicky was, was saying. So I'm just, uh, you know, again, I'm just kind of wanting to build an idea list at the very, at the very least. Go ahead, Vicki. Oh, no, I signed thank you, but then I realized your head was down, so. 
<laughs> this is thank you if anybody doesn't know. <laughs> What's your welcome? How do you how do you sign your welcome? I don't know. I'm still learning. <laughs> I used I used to know, but I forgot. Does anybody know? No, I'll, I, I'm learning. I have a staff member who's deaf right now. Cool. So, and I did two years of sign language and forget almost everything. I do know slow down. <laughs> <laughs> and again, those are like my two most important signs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, anything else? So I, I just added F and again, not, not fleshed out at all, but just uh, remembering that this is also, we want to, uh, include uh, persons with disabilities and, and thinking about that intersectionality of, of a lot of these different issues. Anything else in terms of vision vision and goals that uh, we should put on here or that we've talked about in the past? If not, that's fine. Anything else on the list that we have uh, going right now? Uh, any other thoughts that that people are having? Anything else? Uh, coming to mind that we want to talk about, because if not, I can uh, start moving us uh, through the remainder of the agenda. All right. Um, so action uh, number six on the agenda is um, action items for our subcommittee. Um, action items, y'all? I would say. Hey, real quick. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know a few months ago, one of the action items was to bring to the uh, the whole group the idea of meetings with specific wards. And um, uh, when that discussion happened, I think you, in the general meeting, you weren't there, Jay, but they said they their reaction was, the subcommittee wants to meet with wards. No, that can't happen. Make, make them stop, um, which was, of course, not the intention of uh, you know, bringing it forward, it was that the commission could have regular conversations with the wards. Um, do we have a status on whether that's something the commission wants to do or no? Not that I've heard. Well, maybe that's something to follow up on. Yeah, we, this is Vicki. We, we never really got an answer in. Jay, I think even the following meeting after you missed, you also talked about it and tried to clarify it. Um, it's another one of those things where I feel like we go with specific ideas and we present a report and then nothing happens. Uh, I almost wonder if we, with the report, you know, if we need permission to do something or we want, the full commission to do something that we actually take it as an action item and see if we can get a motion. I, I don't know if that's possible, but I feel like, you know, these the committees report and report and report. Um, and just an FYI, I remembered, thank you and you're welcome are the same. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I, got, what did I say, say again? I said I did not know that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I use thank you all the time, but I didn't know how to say That's great. Yeah. yeah. And usually you mouth thank you or you're welcome um, just because it is the same sign. That's great. Thank you. Um, no, I think you're right, Vicki. I mean, you know, as we have more action items, you know, actually bringing it forward, um, you know, and asking for motions and stuff, which, I, you know, again, I feel like we've kind of tried to do that and it just, I don't know what happens. Well, I feel like you as the chair of this committee, as you're presenting the report, in, can do that. Like you could just make the motion, right? So the, basically on behalf of the committee, we're moving this so I don't know if it, I mean, that's how my board meetings work. So I don't know if we can do that there, but you present something as a formal motion, then we just need a second. Right. No, that's true. And if it's not how it works and somebody will tell us, right? <laughs> we try it and they're like, no, you can't do that. Right. I, I, I'm all about asking for forgiveness instead of permission. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, is there anything uh, for the next uh, full commission meeting that uh, we want to bring as a motion? I, I kind of feel like from this meeting, I'm not picking up on anything that really rises to that at this point. Is there anything that y'all think can think of from our meeting today that we want to take as a, an action item or uh, have a motion for uh, that we've been discussing? Yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like it, what to me it feels like we're doing is is preparing for the larger, uh, you know, commission visioning and kind of goal setting that we're you know hopefully going to do this summer. So, I if if there are any things that you know we want to have a, a motion for or you know request action for, uh, please uh, speak up or I mean, let me know uh, before the next meeting. Um, I guess I mean I I, I feel like. What do you all think about for our next subcommittee meeting? Um, should we just continue to have the conversation about uh, our vision and goals and think a little bit more about next time? Um, you know, maybe we can try and review some of the materials uh, that we've shared over the past couple of years and think about, you know, what is a desegregated slash integrated slash a uh, well-resourced neighborhood city look like, or, or what do you guys think uh, about um, for our next uh, next subcommittee meeting, what we should tackle? Should we continue down this path? Is this constructive or are there other ideas? I like the idea about the conversation. I think I need to be really clear about what that looks like and what, what we want um, so that as we, ask for more support from the commission, we as a committee can be really clear about the things that we're asking for. Yeah, it's a good point, Lori. And I think that like in, in some of the resources and stuff that we've shared over the past couple of years, there are some specific things that we can dig out of there. Like one of the things, you know, and I think, you know, Javier was kind of touching on it uh, to a certain extent, right? It's like, um, you know, home ownership and generational wealth and and that kind of thing you know there's plenty of research out there uh some of which we've shared with each other about um you know uh uh non-white folks basically uh being denied uh, mortgages at a much higher rate than than white folks and you know that's clearly uh, a barrier to home ownership a barrier to building generational wealth and you know, that's the kind of thing I think that we could look at in Tucson, you know, is that is that one of the structural barriers? So, you know, maybe one of the things that we can all try and commit to doing between now and the next meeting is, you know, as we can read through some of those materials and start to identify some of the the barriers that exist and, and you know, really start thinking about that vision kind of like along the lines of, of what you were saying, if I, if I understand you correctly, Laura. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. So we will try and review some materials and identify barriers and also uh, continue with our visioning. You know, I think the other part um that that you know what part of the reason that we're asking as a commission to have a facilitator come in and help us with our you know visioning and where we want to go as a commission is because the 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 place that we're at is actually really hard and it's you know having a facilitator to help us even as a subcommittee work through this and help us get to our vision uh, of what we want to see, like as an integrated Tucson or, you know, the various things that we brought up, uh, you know, is really helpful. And so maybe that's also, um, as we move towards the larger commission, we can really center our, what we're bringing to the table and essentially what we're asking of the facilitator and what we're asking of the full commission is one of our asks is we want as the full commission to have a vision for, you know, what an integrated Tucson looks like and, you know, to identify barriers that have prevented us from getting there. And again, getting our 
our vision um, of our subcommittee to be part of the larger vision uh, of, of what we do moving forward. So um, any other action items uh, for either next things we want to talk about next meeting or um, other action items uh, for the full commission, which I guess really is kind of partly moving into number seven, which is, you know, I've got six is action items for us as our subcommittee and seven is action items for uh, CEHD. So action, any more action items for either our subcommittee or the full commission? I, uh, I'll, I'll bring up one thing to think about since we mentioned um, generational wealth. Um, and I'm not sure anybody wants to engage in this conversation in society at any point, but uh, I think it's worth thinking about if building generational wealth through real estate is compatible with a right to housing. Mm -hmm. Or if it's not. Right. I'm just jotting this down. It's just food for thought. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's such an interesting conversation. Um, because, you know, again, <laughs> without getting too deep in the weeds, but I'm certainly kind of going to open the door. I mean, I just feel like if if there were adequate, if there was adequate permanent affordable housing and, you know, all of the folks who, uh, you know, qualified income wise were able to get a voucher, you know, if we had a more robust system to have housing be more stable, to me, it does seem that it's it's. There is compatibility with um, building generational wealth through housing, but you know maybe that's inaccurate. It just to me, I, I just always go back to, you know, and I, I feel the same way often about gentrification and displacement. You know, if if building wealth through housing had been achievable for people across color lines, you know, I don't know that gentrification and displacement would would even be a thing. And then if you, we also had permanent affordable housing, I, I wonder as well, I don't, without, without getting too much in the weeds, Joe, what do you think? Do you think that they're compatible or do you think that they're, they're not compatible at all? Uh, you are, you are uh, well in, in the weeds at that point. Um, I have some real skepticism. Um, I'm trying to bring it up right now, but uh, yeah. There was a there was a piece. If you're familiar with uh, the author, author uh, Corey Doctorow, he's also a blogger, but he writes. He's a really prolific uh, book writer. But um, one of the things he he had a piece um, about a week and a half ago, and uh, was talking about um, was talking about a few things with housing, which he does once in a while. Um, and the uh, it hit on the commodification and financialization of housing. What he said, I got it here now. Uh, the quote is, transforming housing from a human right to an asset was always going to end in a failure to build new housing stock and regulate rental markets. It's reaching a breaking point. Superstar cities like New York and San Francisco have long been priced out of the reach of working people, but now they're becoming unattainable even for double income, childless, college educated adults in prime working years. A city that you can't live in is a failure. A system that can't provide decent housing is a failure. He he's talking about economists here, but he says the your boss is right actually crowd one. We don't build public housing, we don't regulate rents and it sucks. Maybe we could try doing things instead of aligning incentives. Like how about rent control? He goes on a bit, but um, if anybody wants to read it, I will drop it in chat. Um, and I'm also, it, it, commodification and financialization are things that I'm, I tend to be attuned to. A lot of my entry into thinking about housing was through displacement and gentrification and what's, what's kind of possible. And some of the first people I really followed were uh, United Nations Special Rapporteurs for Adequate Housing. Um, and what, like there's an actual UN definition of what adequate housing means. Like there's things like security of tenure where 
you can't just a landlord can't just say, yeah, I don't want to, I, I don't have a reason, but I'm not going to rent to you anymore. Right, you're, you're, you're gone. Um, and and kind of looking at where we fall short because America falls drastically short when it comes to the discussion of the parameters of adequate housing and and um, what the you know, you can talk about this back to 1872 at least, but um, but over the last like 2008 post-crisis uh, financial, that, that financial slash housing crisis, increasing financialization and commodification, hyper-financialization, some are call, calling it, of housing and, and, and what that's meant um, in terms of whether a right to housing is fulfillable and whether it's um, whether it's something that can coincide with real estate investment trusts, private equity, uh, housing ownership, all those all those things we're, we're seeing. I don't yeah. I don't know if it is or not. I have real skepticism. Well, yeah, uh, I, think, I think it's interesting too because you know there are always gonna be people that are gonna to need to rent, right? Not everybody is ever going to be in a place for home ownership, right? Some people are too young, some people don't want to. I mean, you know, there are just a million reasons why one wouldn't be a homeowner. And I just feel like with, you know, to, to hear like people just not renewing tenants for, for whatever reason, I'm like, not that this is true across the board, but I'm like, you know, most mom and pop landlords that, you know, maybe have a couple of units that they're renting or, you know, kept an old house that they don't live in anymore, or, you know, whatever the case may be, the idea of like running off a renter that is a good renter that's, you know, paying on time and, you know, more or less, you know, living in the property like, like a normal person, the idea of like that person leaving is like most landlords worst nightmare, you know, it's like you want the person to stay there as long as possible. So, you know, it is interesting the the different kind of gradients of the gradient of like you know mom and pop versus yeah a hedge fund you know doing everything they can to you know pump the most profit out of their their units and I think the other thing too is like you know in this country it's really hard to build wealth which in the long run is essentially security in old age or your ability to care for your family or put your kids through college. I mean, doing that without home ownership in this country is extremely challenging. If you could be a renter and still build wealth in a way that was, you know, actually worked for you and wasn't, you know, such a, a crapshoot, I, I don't know that, you know, housing would be such the commodity that it is. And it's easy to understand why, at least in my opinion, why homeowners in particular neighborhoods get so bent out of shape about things that there's no proof that it's going to de decrease property values, but if you know, seventy five percent of your eggs are in the the housing basket, so to speak, that the idea of property values decreasing is very scary and very real, whether or not it's you know actually going to happen. So, yeah, it's uh, the fact that we build so much wealth through housing does make it make it challenging, I guess. Jay, one of one of my hottest housing takes. You're right there, and this is something that's been talked about a few a few different places. And actually, um, uh, I'm pretty anti Yimby, but uh, Ned Resnikoff is a guy who worked at UC San Francisco and went to work for California Yimby, and he had a whole piece. It was a kind of a Twitter thread, and one of the one of the takeaways was um, you touch and you touched on it right here is you know how to fix NIMBYism. You know how to fix NIMBYism. It's untying the wealth of people and communities from real estate value. And the best way to make people NIMBYs is crush labor power. People can't make any money via, via their labor. And they see who's getting wealthy is people who have assets. So they want, they need to, instead of making money through labor, get it through assets. And the easiest asset for most people um, and historically, especially white people to get has been housing. And if you want to, I, I, I say this low key, and this is one of the reasons I organize with our local labor federation. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we get out of this without labor power. 
<laughs> yeah, talk about intersectionality and uh, crossing crossing boundaries. Yeah, it's a it's a whole other whole other topic. But yeah, really interesting. Um, so obviously, Joe, you and I got in the weeds a little bit. I'm going to get us out of the weeds because we're coming to the, end of the meeting, and I think our, uh, our our friends here might start nodding off. But <laughs> anyway. Um, at this point, I'm going to move on to call to the audience. Um, this is a time when any member of the public may address the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development. Due to time constraints, the total time allocated for this is 15 minutes. Individuals are allowed three minutes each. Due to open meeting law, Commission members cannot discuss topics that are not on the agenda. Items brought up by the public may be considered as an agenda item for future meetings. So is there anyone in the audience uh, who would like to speak? Okay, um, next steps. So um, just for everybody's information, uh, the Housing First subcommittee meeting is May 31st at 4 p.m. Uh, the next full commission meeting is June 4th at, I mean, June 1st at 4 p.m. Uh, then Affordable Housing subcommittee, June 21st at 4 p.m. And then our Housing Desegregation subcommittee is June 22nd and July 27th, both at 1 p.m. Uh, any questions about uh, next steps or any of those meetings? Okay, Neto, any last uh, words from you before we adjourn? We're good to go. Well, it's good to see you all. <laughs> good to see you too. Thanks, uh, thanks for being with us, Neto. And thanks, uh, Joe and Javier, for attending. And obviously, uh, Vicki and Lori, I really appreciate you all's uh, service to subcommittee and the commission. And if there is nothing else going once, going twice, going three times, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.